Hello, this is Eastern Europe Review, a joint production of Belsat TV and TVP World, featuring news and analysis from Belarus, Russia and Ukraine. My name is Sergei Belesa and here are today's stories. Why are residents returning to the frontline towns of Ukraine? People were counting on something, at least some help from the state, but they were let down and that's it. Georgia's European future is in grave danger. This is a Russian law that is trying to establish an authoritarian regime in this country. The Hunger Games in Russia. Pensioners are fighting for expired foods. Look at the state we're in. Pensioners are sorting through expired food. The frontline town of Arikiv in the Zaporizhia region has been left in ruins after more than two years of Russian invasion. Despite the devastation and persistent shelling, residents have begun to return to their homes this spring. Our colleagues have investigated the situation in the frontline town to understand why people are returning to their extremely unsafe homes. In the Zaporizhia region, residents are beginning to return to the frontline town of Orihiv. Only some have received state aid under the Temporarily Displaced Persons program. To feed themselves, people are planting vegetable gardens and living off them. Natalia was left without social assistance. Unable to find a job in Zaporizhia, she had to return to her hometown of Orihiv. I'm 58 years old. You have to drop everything to get a job there or I don't know what to do. Well, I'm at home. I love the countryside, so I'm staying at home for the time being. Social payments, amounting to about $60 per month, have remained unchanged for all temporarily displaced persons, but only for certain categories, specifically those who do not work and do not have children under the age of 18. This is Natalia's situation. Now she hopes to survive on her vegetable garden. It was crucial for me. It was my only income, 2,000 hryvnias. My children come to Zaporozhye for treatment. My granddaughter had two operations. This money was important to me, how can I say it? It's expensive to get to Zaporozhye, and it costs 120 hryvnias to take a minibus that goes to Zaporozhye from here. It was important for me. Natalia's neighbor, Valentina, took her granddaughter to Zaporizhia to keep her safe. However, she cannot leave the farm unattended. She grows vegetables without any feeling of fear, despite Russian shelling. She has learned when to work the land and when to hide. We can hear it, can't we? If it's not our army, there will be an answer in half an hour. Then you'll hide. If it's ours, then it's fine. The woman, just like her neighbor, lives off her vegetable garden and humanitarian aid. It's difficult, especially for those who have nothing. I'm 61 years old and I don't have a pension yet. At present, about 960 people live in Orihiv under constant Russian shelling. The head of the local military administration body confirms that those who left for Zaporizhia have begun to return this spring. The tendency is that when payments to temporarily displaced persons were stopped, people slowly started to return. Not all of them, but one or two people have returned to the town and registered with us. Some locals who have been evacuated to Zaporizhia commute every day to Orihiv to work at the local market. A shopkeeper, Natalia, says she earns a living and does not need an allowance, but she feels sorry for others. People were counting on something, at least some help from the state, but they were let down and that's it. In the whole Orihev community, there are now 1,320 people. Before Russia's full-scale war against Ukraine, there were about 14,000 residents. People are also returning to other frontline villages to live under shelling, where there is no work except household chores. 
A serious political conflict is unfolding in Georgia. The ruling party, along with the Prime Minister, aims to pass a bill on the transparency of foreign influence. Many view this bill as a copy of Russia's repressive law concerning so-called foreign agents. Every day people are taken to the streets to protest against this law. The Georgian president has sided with the protesters and vowed to veto the bill if it passes the legislature. The law could jeopardize Georgia's future in the European Union. No to Russia, yes to Europe. This is the slogan of the protests taking place in Georgia against the adoption of the law on transparency of foreign influence. Every day, thousands of people are gathering in front of the Georgian parliament. This protest won't stop. You can see what it's like. The home, family and workplace of every Georgian citizen are on Rustaveli Avenue and other places where protests will be held until this state threat is neutralized. Protesters are demanding a meeting with the country's Prime Minister Irakli Kobahidze. The head of the Georgian government has previously stated that the law would definitely be adopted. Nothing can interfere with the defense of state sovereignty and with the final adoption of the law, therefore. The controversial bill on the transparency of foreign influence was adopted by the Georgian parliament in its first reading on April the 17th. The initiators of the bill claim that its purpose is to ensure transparency of foreign funding of non-governmental organizations and the media. Organizations and the media outlets will be required to register as agents of foreign influence and file declarations if more than 20% of their income comes from abroad. We want to know who is funding what in this country in order to protect our security and protect our country from being drawn into the war you so persistently advocate for. The opposition refused to take part in the vote, believing that the bill is a copy of Russia's repressive law on so-called foreign agents. They argue that this will negatively impact democracy and freedom of speech and complicate Georgia's accession to the European Union. Yes, this is a Russian law that is trying to establish an authoritarian regime in this country. But you, the authors of this evil, are making a mistake. Georgia is not Russia. The Georgian people are fighting for freedom and will definitely achieve final victory. The Kremlin fully supports the adoption of the Georgian version of the law on foreign agents. In Russia, this law has been used as a tool to pressurize civil society, independent media, politicians and activists. However, Vyacheslav Volodin, the speaker of the Russian state Duma, has once again employed his favorite rhetorical device, pointing out that the history of the law on foreign agents dates back to the 1938 in the United States. They are misleading the public that there is such a law in America. In America, the context is completely different. This concerns business, other types of funds. This concerns other legal relations. Let's not get confused. The ruling party is trying to pass the bill through parliament for the second time. Last year, facing pressure from mass protest, they abandoned the idea. Now, Georgian President Salome Zurabishvili has called the bill a direct provocation a Russian strategy of destabilization, and has promised to veto it. However, experts believe that the ruling party will manage to push it through. The main concern of the opposition is that the bill could mark the beginning of the end of Georgia's European integration. This law completely undermines all our European prospects, and everyone understands this. In the past, protests were different. Political parties brought people out onto the streets. Now this protest is absolutely spontaneous. People are coming out on their own. No one's organizing them, both young people and the older generation. Absolutely everyone who understands that we are jeopardizing our goal of joining the European Union by 2030.
Experts point out that parliamentary elections are scheduled to take place in Georgia this October. The adoption of the bill on so-called foreign agents could create significant problems for the current government. The timing raises questions. Why do they need to pass this bill now, especially when it could jeopardize their hold on power? Moscow's role in this whole process remains a mystery. Markets selling expired food are gaining popularity in Russian regions. The main customers are elderly people who cannot afford quality food on their state pensions. However, that's only the peak of the iceberg. Pensioners stand guard at supermarket waste containers waiting for expired goods to be discarded. There have even been fights over free food. This is Krasnoyarsk a city in Siberia with a population of over a million people. It's the center of one of Russia's wealthiest regions and home to some of the largest metallurgy and machine building companies' plants. Yet on the city's outskirts, there is a market that specializes in selling expired products. Sellers openly admit that the goods are close to spoiling, but the prices are several times lower than in regular stores. For many pensioners, this is their only option to survive on a modest old age allowance. Shame on our government. The only thing I can say is shame. Let them come here and themselves try it out and adjust their salaries to resemble our pensions. Larisa, a pensioner, comes here for groceries once a week. She says she has already learnt to choose packaging with contents that are relatively safe to eat, though it's necessary for people to look carefully at the expiry date. If it's been out for a month, I won't be poisonous because it's stored well, plus it's cold. It is illegal to trade in expired products in Russia. Nevertheless, such markets continue to operate freely in many Russian cities. Elderly people who can barely afford such purchases are waiting for the moment when supermarket employees discard expired goods. Here in Voronezh, located 500 kilometers south of Moscow, pensioners are approaching a shop assistant pushing a trolley with such products. This is Novosibirsk, often called the capital of Siberia. At the back of a grocery store, people are scuffling over discarded products without paying any attention to passers-by. Look at the state we're in. Pensioners are sorting through expired food. Not only pensioners are struggling financially, but also families who until recently considered themselves well off. Daria Stepanova, a mother of two from a small town in the Urals in the center of the country, says that more than two years after the Russian army invaded Ukraine, prices have increased significantly. Now the entire family budget is spent on basic food. I spend all my money on groceries, and there is no extra money left for some nice things, for treats. Of course, you can live without such things, but now life has become less enjoyable. According to official data, inflation in Russia in 2023 was at 7.5 percent. However, independent analysts' calculations show that the actual increase in food prices exceeded 20 percent. This is significantly higher than the indexation of state benefits. Credit statistics can serve as an indirect indicator of declining living standards. If you take the statistics of the Bank of Russia, you can see it all there. Just how many Russians have two or three loans and how many families. They don't just spend half of their monthly earnings on loan repayments, but up to 80 percent. Officially, 13 and a half million people in the country live below the poverty line, meaning they have an income below the subsistence minimum of $170. However, economists suggest the actual number is more than 20 million. In other words, nearly one in seven Russians live in poverty. These are all the stories we have prepared for today. Thank you for watching Eastern Europe Review. Please continue to stay tuned to TVP World.